Well, welcome everybody. I see one. I see, it's, I feel like I'm in a romper room. I don't know if you've ever watched the Rambo cartoon where they used to put a little mirror in the front and say, I see Kelly and I see Dionisi and all the different people. Um, but it reminds me of romper room when I see all the names on here and that's fantastic. Um, and I want, we're, gonna, we're a couple of minutes early, we're about, about two minutes early. So I wanted to mention something that's exciting and I, and I haven't announced it yet on, uh, on our social media, but Florin, our iconographer is coming. Um, he has arrived already in Mississauga, Toronto to finish the church in Prophet Elias in Mississauga, but um, Florin is coming and he will be installing the back wall, the wall of martyrs. Um, he has it ready and will be installing it. Um, he will be installing it on um, December 5th and 6th. So just in time for St. Nicholas, he will be installing uh, our first set of icons at the back of the narthex, which is really exciting. Because of COVID, that's as far as he's got. So he's gonna uh, stay until Christmas and then go back um, go back home for Christmas and then start on our balcony wall with all the icons of the Vana Yeah. So it's pretty exciting. And I'm hoping by the summer, we should be done. Um, it's pretty It's pretty yeah. awesome. No, I just but want that's to great news, we have progress. Yay. You can close the door while you're coming out. Just. Okay. Let me just check on one thing. Right. Kalispera, let's start with the prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, present everywhere and filling all things, treasure your goodness and giver of life. Come abide in us, cleanse us every stain and save our souls. A good one. Amen. Kalispera, good evening, everybody. So today's Father, today's can I ask something? Yes. Father, I, I cannot see myself. Katia Kokani. That's okay. I hear you. I hear your lovely voice, and I think we'll be okay. Yeah, blepo. Uh, okay, so Okay, go on. Oh, there you are. There, I see your garbage can. So I think your camera fell down. It's not a garbage can. It's a vase. <laughs> Is it a mug? A vase. Oh, a vase. Ooh, it, it's such a, well. It looks like a very pretty garbage can. Was not to hear So thank you, Father. I love it. Leave one. I'm not sure, but that's okay. okay. I don't mind. We don't mind looking at the vase. Everybody else's cameras are shut off, but we don't mind looking at the boss. That's okay. Thank you. Today, everybody, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, chatting about um, just doing a question and answer period. It was last session. It was in, in demand. Um, the question and answer, answer session was in demand. I think it's important that we do it. Um, because it gives me a better flavor of where every, the majority of the people are. Um, you know, when you ask your questions, then we know where you stand in terms of your faith, what I need to focus on as a group and whatever works. So um, I, the only thing I can guarantee is that I don't know everything. I'm not going to give you a half answer. Uh, I will give you a full answer where I can, or I will say I don't know. Uh, there's a limited capacity up here and it gets more and more limited as we get a little bit older and I'm feeling it. So if I don't know, it's probably because I don't remember. And so I will give, if I don't know, I will give you a full answer via email or I'll put it on the Facebook website or something like that. So um, does anybody have any questions they thought of in the last, uh, oh, I posted yet, yeah, I posted earlier today. So during the day, as you were working or or sleeping or contemplating or praying. Does anybody have any questions um, that they want to um, start with? No, nobody. Uh, I can't, I mean, let, me find the, the, let me find the screen because I usually type the questions. Not sure where that screen is, but I will find it. One moment, please. More chat. There it is. I found it. Okay, I don't have any questions on the chat. George. Okay, I go. Hang on. This. Okay, here's a couple of questions. Um, Couple of questions here. Let's start with the easy one, then I'll get to the next one. Um, what the question is: As a newly baptized Orthodox Christian, what is expected of me? 
Um, that's a very, that's a very um, complicated question, but at the same time, it's a very simple question to be Christ-like. What's expected of us is to be Christ-like. Um, and through the catechism and through the teachings of the church, uh, it teaches us uh, through our prayers and through, and, 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 and everything, it teaches us how to be Christ-like. The Orthodox Church teaches us how to be closer to him and holier to him. So follow the, follow the, the rubrics of how to worship. Um, keep reading the Bible and learn through the Orthodox Study Bible of what everything means and how it applies to you and how it applies to me. And the most important commandment in there is the 11th commandment to love one another. If we start with love and we base everything on Christ's love, then everything falls into place. That's the, that's, that's the simple answer I can give you, but just follow your teachings. Follow, um, follow your faith. Follow the teachings of the faith. And, uh, and you remember, just take baby steps. You can crawl, you have to crawl before you walk and walk before you run. No one is expecting you to fast 40 days right off the get go or to have the perfect confession or to remember everything um, on what you're supposed to do. That, that comes in time, and that, time that comes with teaching and that comes with teaching in love. So that's, but that's a very good question. The next question is what the next question is, what do you teach about Genesis 6-4? Allow me to pull up Genesis 6-4. Because I don't have everything memorized yet. Genesis chapter 6, verse 4 says. As much as I did get an A plus in Old Testament, I didn't memorize everything. Genesis 6, chapter 4. In those days, and even later, this is a very good, this is a very good passage. Listen to listen closely. In those days and even later, there were giants on earth uh, who were descendants of human women and the supernatural beings. They were great heroes and famous men of long ago. Um, we do understand that they actually have a name. And actually, this is what I was going to bring up. And what I was, go I'm going to answer that right now, but, but, but pause for a commercial break. Um, there is a book that I'm going to bring up on, on the, on the, on the, um, uh, on the screen I'm going to share. And it's called the 455 questions and answers about orthodoxy. And I'll answer, I'll answer George, I'll answer that right away. Um, but allow me to just find something. One moment, please. I'm really trying to, I'm really trying to get fast with uh, this Zoom thing. I'll be a lot faster soon. So I'm sharing the screen right now. I think I'm sharing the screen right now with, um, oh, somebody. I should be sharing the screen right now. One moment, oh, here it is. Okay, does everybody see this? Nikki, can you see on the screen the book? Yes, I can. Okay, so this book, The Orthodox Church, 455 questions and answers. I have an older edition, so it has a little bit of a different cover. Um, this book was for my generation, for example, for, for your daughter, Angie, um, Nikki, and our generation, the 70s and 80s, this book came out and before the internet was around, it was the Ann Landers, if everybody, remember, you know, we all remember Ann Land Landers, it was the Ann Landers uh, or the Dear Abbey of Orthodoxy. I have my, this isn't my copy, but my copy is so hacked up. It was the Bible when I was younger and it was 455 questions to answer about orthodoxy. And one of the, and I suggest everybody get this book. I am going to order a few copies, but if anybody's interested, please call me. It is incredible. It has that many questions about our faith and it has them in alphabetical order. And I actually remember 
uh, the about the uh, about Genesis chapter six four. It was, and it it does comment on it. It's question number three hundred two, and um, it, it talks about the nephilim. Nephilim is the term of these uh, these um, giants, so to speak. Um, it tells us it tells us in this book that this is a very difficult verse to interpret. Nephilim seems to be giants or very tall men, and this verse seeks to provide an explanation for their existence. Uh, they were believed; these giants were believed to have lived in Canaan in times before the Israelites were given the promised land. And the term "sons of God" in this context refers to divine-like beings, perhaps types of angels. Uh, where we who were assumed to have been have par parented with human women children that became these Nephilim giants. In this context as well is the connection made between the Nephilim with the perception of um, human wickedness, which results in God limiting the length of human life, thus indicating the reality of human mortality more clearly. There's not a, so there's not a fully satisfactory understanding of this passage. There's not a fully under, under, um, there's not a fully um, understood of, of that pass, pa, um, of, of that. But however, you can look at your Orthodox study Bible, the Old Testament. They may comment on it as well. I happen to just give away the last copy I had here, so I don't have the Orthodox study Bible here. Oops. Uh, but, uh, I just have the New Testament, not the not the old. But we can look at the Orthodox Study Bible and 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 take a look in the um, in the footnotes on six four uh, on Genesis six four. So I don't have a full explanation for you, but if you have your Orthodox Study Bible at home, take a look um, and and see if it uh, does provide a footnote, a more of a footnote, because this book was written in the eighties. There are some things that are out of date. Uh, some cultural things that are out of date, but, but the teachings remain the same. Great question, though. So allow me to unscreen share for a second. Okay. Oh, very good. There is a podcast. There is a podcast called "Lord of Spirits" by Father Andrew Stephen Damick. Uh, yes, about the Nephilim. About the Nephilim. Excellent. There is a ton of questions in here. I don't have any more questions from anybody, but there are a ton of questions in here that I would like to address because they have been asked before and and. Um, I'm I, I'm kind of surprised that they're not being brought up because people are asking me these questions. A really big one that's come up now recently is a lot recently is about cremation. And um, cremation is 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 a, is a very common form of um, of of how people are taking care of their loved ones after they, they pass away. And cremation, um, cremation is, um, is forbidden in the Orthodox Church. It is, in the North American, North American society, it is 80% of all funerals that resulted after the funeral resulting cremation. That's a very high number, but in the Orthodox Church, we still forbid it. Um, it's something that um, the, the Orthodox study, the Orthodox study Bible, um, or sorry, the Orthodox questions and answers does talk about. It is something I'd like to bring up today because I've got a lot of questions about it. Again, like I said, we we uh, there's a couple of reasons why um, in cremation is against our faith. Um, first of all, if we take it from a traditional perspective, Christ was um, Christ was buried. And therefore, uh, we are we are buried as well. Uh, we follow the tradition of what they did to Christ. As, uh, you know, we emulate all actions that uh, that they did to Christ. That's number one. Not satisfactory for all the people arguing these points, but I really.
so something a lot of people don't know is that Presbyteria Linda, prior to her um, disability and her short career as a, a, a living her life dream as a corrections officer, she was in the funeral business for a period of time as she was starting her career. So um, because she was in the funeral business, she did learn a lot of things. She saw the oven and people get cremated and how, how the whole procedure works. And I know how the procedure works now because I've spent time with a lot of the funeral directors. Um, what we need to know is that we should not be desecrating the, the temple of the Holy Spirit because we know that we, it's told in scripture that this is the temple of the Holy Spirit and we should not be desecrating this temple, right? So we should not burn it. Um, we don't, we, when we have a rental, when we rent an apartment, we don't kick holes in it. We don't damage it because it's not ours. As our body is not ours, it belongs to the, 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 the Lord and it houses the temple of the Holy Spirit. Knowing that, um, we can't burn the body. And also, when you, know, when you know the procedure of cremation, the larger bones, uh, the larger bones um, in our legs and our skull and our pelvis don't burn. So when, when they cremate a body, they burn the, the flesh on all the outside, but the major, the major bones don't turn into ash. Therefore, and that's very hard to do unless you keep it in there for six hours. Nobody wants to spend that kind of fuel money. So what happens is the bones that are left over are put in a grinder. The same way, oh. we, we, same way we grind coffee beans, there's a massive grinder that grinds everything into dust. Yeah. So you are not being, only being burnt, you're being ground. And that's a, that's a real desecration. This happens with everyone who's cremated. Your body just doesn't come out like dust and it gets swept into a pizza box or a box, sorry. Um, as you can tell, I'm not a fan. So with regards to cremation, um, again, we're desecrating it in, in two different ways. We are also expecting our body to, to come and meet our soul again um, uh, in, in a spiritualized fashion. So that's why we don't want to touch. We want to bury it according to tradition and not burn it. Those are the uh, traditional aspects of it. Um, they're checking for questions. No, um, that is a traditional aspect of it. Now, I really would like to talk also about the psychological aspect of cremation. Uh, and this comes out of experience. This is not like stuff you read in a book, uh, but it is becoming stuff that you read in a book because of the um, because of the results of the psychological results that now in, 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 in a high cremation demographic um, are coming out. And the biggest one is closure. Closures, psychological closure. Number one, we need, uh, we need somewhere to go. It, the, the, the statistics are showing that when someone dies, we need to bury them because we need somewhere to go. We need to go to the cemetery, spend time at that one place where we can be with that person where they are buried and find a closure. Um, the, ancient, uh, the ancients, um, and to this day, a lot of people in Northern Greece you know, spread, ha had a meal there, a full meal with the deceased and the family. They spread out the picnic. Uh, it was a big picnic over the grave. They did that pre-Christian times. They did that early Christian times. And people still do it now sometimes. Because we psychologically, whether it was 2,000 years ago or now, need that closure, need to be with that loved one. Because it reminds us of our, our mortality, where we're going to end up. It brings us a closure and a unity, even when the person is deceased. We're a family together with those who are deceased. And that's what happens when we go, not only when we have a meal there, like some families do, but when we go to visit, we visit, we're again, united in spirit with the deceased. We have somewhere to go. If we cremate, different feelings come, come to us. First of all, we have nowhere to go. If anywhere the, the cremated remains, um, end up like on the top of the fireplace in some location in the house. Uh, and my ex personal experience over 13 years in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and even here now, people are finding it very uncomfortable to have that urn at home. Mm -hmm. And they're calling, and, they, and, and I, don't, I can't tell you how many times uh, I've gone out to say a prayer for that person in the urn who is being buried 
because they don't know what else to do, bury it on top of somebody else, one of their other family members in the cemetery. They're burying that urn so they can have a closure, which they thought they didn't need. They didn't realize they needed 10 years ago. They're finding out they need it now. So I've done a lot of urn burials, which is very odd. We don't have, like that for the Orthodox Church, it's very odd, but we do have a prayer, simple prayer, but the Sion prayer to say at the cemetery and then we put it down into the grave. But it's a huge issue for closure for the family and to have some now have somewhere to go again like i mean that's the best that's the best we can do after they have burned the remains but that's the best we can do to bury it on top of another loved one you're allowed to do that two feet down so we um people are finding their closure again but in a different way unfortunately but it shows that how important burial is to the to, to the to the soul to the to the soul and the psychology of the living people and that's why it's so important to, 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 to even though burial, quote unquote, may be more expensive and a little, and a little more work to do. For, well, don't we want to dedicate that, give that dedication to that person who passed away? So, so and psychologically, there are also a lot of accidents that happen. For example, Yaya dies and gets cremated and gets put on top of the mantle. Papu dies and the kids are out of town and they tell the moving company just to throw out everything, not realizing that this, the watch, there's an urn up there and, it's in, and if it's in a fancy shape, you don't even know that it's an urn because urns comes in all shapes and sizes and colors. It could get thrown away. So, and nobody noticed. And I, you know, there's so many accidents like that happen when a person is cremated and, and they're not rare. What I'm bringing up is not just a rare occasion where um, this happened. I walked into funeral homes where I opened the closet to put in my jacket and they're going, no, 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 father. I'm like, what are they, all these urns doing here in this closet? Well, these are all the unclaimed people. And the funeral tells you we're the only ones who keep them for five, 10, 15 years and keep calling the family. Every other funeral home throws them in the garbage. Mm -hmm. And that's a reality, guys. These are conversations I've had with funeral homes, with people over the last 15 years or so. Um, there's just a lot of things that just don't work psychologically for us, especially for us who are living for cremation. There's nothing romantic about it or the romanticism of spreading your ashes in the river, or, you know, over the farm, or there's nothing romantic about it. In the end, it really, it can tear apart a family psychologically because they don't have closure. And we have a hard time enough dealing with death. So add these things that we think are right, but are actually detrimental to us, then that's the problem with cremation. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about that? About burial? Cremation? Well, you guys are a tough crowd tonight. Are there any more questions, guys? I always get blasted on these sessions. So it's just so quiet on the screen. Does anybody want to have anything to say or? Aha. Uh -huh. Any thought? Here's another question. Any thoughts on how to balance embracing the beautiful things of creation versus trying to live spiritually instead of materially? And the question on oh, next the next question, which which is still on cremation. I'll get back to that one. Next question is. Um, do you have do you do any kind of music at the funeral? Yes, chanters chant. There are specific funeral hymns. The funeral is basically like a set play in football. All of our the wedding, the baptism, the funeral, they're all set plays. Like there's not very much variation. This is these are the hymns. This is what you do. And that's important because the church fathers wrote all these and um, wrote all these rites and sacramental and all the prayers and hymns in them. And you can't mess with perfection. They're just incredible. So the, even the funeral prayers are incredible themselves if we really look at them. Next question, how do we, how do you recommend a person um, who is allergic to fish to fast? That's a very good question. And why do we fast from certain kinds of foods? Okay, first things first. How do, we rec how do we recommend a person who is allergic to fish to fast? 
okay, your fast will be modified. The fast, the way we fast are guidelines in terms of, and I'll explain those in a second, why we fast certain things. The way um, fasting, again, is, is um, it, you, you talk to your spiritual father. I don't expect a new person who, into orthodoxy to fast for 40 days, okay? You're walking before you can crawl. That's not right. We need to uh, kind of dip our feet in the water first before we start swimming. So that's something to talk to your priest or your spiritual father about, about how to fast, especially, especially if you do have restrictions. I'm a diabetic, for example. I, the only things I can really eat that won't affect me are meat and vegetables, some vegetables. So my menu is extremely, extremely limited. The fasting foods that you guys can eat, like macaroni and, um, and bread and, and, and rice, don't apply to me because they, the glycemic index is so high that they just shoot up my sugars. So I can't live on just a few vegetables I'm going to pass out. So I have a modified fast that my spiritual father um, approves that I have to stick to. Now, why do we fast for certain kinds of foods? And I like that. Um, one second. Yes, please, period. When can you do that question mark? Sorry about that. I got a little bit of emergency. Um, so in terms of fasting, I'd like to, I'm going to give you a short answer. I'd like to approach that um, as a longer answer in an actual session about fasting coming up because Christmas is coming up. Um, we can talk, uh, we fast with certain kinds of foods. Now, I will answer that with a question. And how, the question is, Oh, let me get the next person into the room. Um, I'm going to answer the question about fasting. Um, why do we fast certain kinds of foods? I'm going to answer it with a question. Why do we fast from olive oil, but not olives? Aren't they the same thing? Why do we fast from wine and not grapes? Aren't they the same thing? And those are the questions I get often. So that's an under, let me, let me, so let me answer that question that I just asked. What we do is in, 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 especially in history, the, we're trying to avoid the expensive foods, the luxuries of life. So the grapes were a staple food product. Wine was a processed product. So it was a luxury. It was expensive, more expensive than grapes. Um, olives were a staple product in the Mediterranean, in the Middle East. So they were a staple product, a simple product that you ate, a whole food, whereas olive oil was processed. It was more expensive. So the, one of the goals of fasting was to, to stick to a certain diet that was not expensive, that were simple foods, whole foods. So um, no, doing that you'd have a lesser of a food budget, a cheaper food budget, because you ate the cheaper foods, the less expensive foods, the simple foods. You had so you had money left over during that fasting period. What did you do with it? You gave it to the poor. So fasting consists of restricting yourself of a certain diet, eating less as well, praying more, alms giving with the leftover money from your food budget, because you're not eating as much and you're not eating the expensive foods, which are water, wine and meat. And, uh, and and olive oil at the time. Make sense? Um, so that's, fasting is a package deal. We'll get more into the detail of fasting when we actually have a session in the next couple of weeks. Um, and uh, that's that question for now. Thank you, Natalie. Back to the original, back to the other question we were looking at, any thoughts on how to balance embracing the beautiful things of creation versus trying to live spiritually instead of mentally. So I'm going to take the context of spiritually versus mentally to mean to concentrate on things of this earth, oh, sorry, materially, things of this earth materially versus the spiritual things, the things of God. And um, how to balance the things of creation. Okay, we can look at it several ways. Um, we can look at it uh, as as less is more. Okay, less is it's and, and that's a really big issue. Uh, um, less is more in our lives. We can see a lot of things in creation. It's it's it, when when we when we see things in creation and we enjoy them. That it, that's just just such an incredible feeling that God has given us all these things. Now, when we start to want and want and accumulate and hoard, 
then we're getting a lot more material than we are spiritual, right? We want to enjoy the earth and the, and, and the, and the fruits of it. But we, we like, the, like the ancient Greek said, pan metronariston, excellence in moderation. We have to really be careful that, that the enjoying the spiritual, the, 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 uh, the beautiful things of creation um, and that God has given us and that God has given us the brains to manufacture doesn't become a dependency that we can let go of we will, should be able to let go of that possession without feeling sad we should be able to think who needs it more than i do that's our that's our you know that's embracing the things of creation and living more spiritually is saying hey look what i have in my hands who wants this who needs this i don't need it i think somebody else needs it more than i do so less is more to be able to enjoy something and then give it away is, 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 is getting Christ-like, is, is getting unselfish, you know, um, that's the most, that's a, that's a very, that's, that's a very base, like the, the bar of doing God's will. And that's an example uh, of uh, balancing, uh, the, you can balance so much when you have less on your plate. It's so easier to balance something when you have so little on your plate. And then you see that with the monastics and the monks. And we, and even here in the city, we can live simply. About 99% of us choose not to. And that's what confuses us and, and, and kind of makes things messy. We focus on less on the spiritual, uh, less on the spiritual and more on the material. Does that make sense? Next question, any thoughts? on great orthodox reads after the study Bible and the Philokalia and the four of course, the Nazareth. Um, yes, but one at a time. Ask me again next month when you finish the book. And just one at a time. And that, that's a very good question. Next question is, which missionaries uh, or charities does the church collect for? Um, in the United States, it's a little more organized. Uh, in, the, in the United States, it's a little more organized, whereas they have they have an affiliation, and so do we. But they have a stronger affiliation with in, with um, IOCC, which is in International Orthodox Christian Charities. They have a stronger affiliation with, and and, and that international group has a list of Orthodox charities that that we can. Uh, that we can give them the money and they can disperse or we they can give us a list of 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 uh charities that are under their umbrella that we can help um and whether orthodox or not they have a list of uh of, of charities that we can help so we try and they're, they're the one they're the investigative watchdog which which you know we know we're legitimately giving our money to certain charities uh we do we do subscribe to them too like we do um have a have a relationship with with them too but here in Canada, our uh, our fundraising and missionary work usually goes to specific institutions. Well, 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 we'll try to support the monastery. We'll try to we'll we'll try to support the monastery. We'll try to support um, uh, other programming within the archdiocese. Um, so yeah, it's um, we don't have a specific. We don't go to the IOCC specifically like the Americans do, but we. We do have a paper trail of of the of where we uh, where we um, donate to and and the groups and the, the 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 missionaries and charities that we that we donate to. So we do have a uh, a um, a list or a list of le of legitimate um, sources and and we keep a paper trail of it too. Next question. That's and this is a wide open. This is pretty wide open. Um, what does the what does what do you teach about theosis? I don't teach anything about theosis. The church teaches about theosis. Christ teaches about theosis, and I, and I know that's what you meant. But um, the, theosis. I will give you a little bit of a breakdown on what. The, for those of you who don't know what that is, I'll give you a bit of a breakdown because we have that in the book here. Um, I remember clearly we have that in the book uh, uh, in the 455 questions and answers I just do it's probably in the back here somewhere I do have to find it because I remember it 
the question number 432. So it's way in the back because it's alphabetical. It starts with T. Um, let me look for it. So I'll give you, I'll give you a breakdown on that. So basically, Theos is just to, just to refresh, refresh everybody, is becoming God-like. Well, of course, we can't become gods. God is of one essence. We can't have the essence of God. We can participate in his energies, right? But we don't have the essence of God. He's the creator. We're the created. Completely different species. God is not a species. God just is. So we try to become God-like. And how do we, come, how do, we do that? We, it basically to be in the image of and likeness of God, to be perfectly human, to be, to be and beyond human, to be superhuman. And that's what Christ taught us. Taught Christ, we have the original beauty of our original creation when, when we achieve theosis. Here's a perfect, a great example from St. Athanasius of Sinai. He says, Theosis is the elevation to what is better, but not the reduction of our nature to something less. Nor is it an essential change of our human nature. So it's not a change of our human nature. It's a divine plan. It is the willing condescension of tremendous dimension by God, which he did for the salvation of others. So that which is of God so when we are of God, we are lifted up to a greater glory. And that's what theosis is being like um, without, our, without our nature changing. We're still human, but we're lifted up to a greater glory. And how do we do that? Again, similar to the original question of the person who said they were being baptized. What's my responsibility, what's my responsibility now? That original question we had is to fully and completely live the Christian life. To live in full communion with God. And that's not necessarily easy because we live in a secular world. It's very hard, but we, we that's our struggle. That's our struggle as Orthodox Christians. Um, like I said, like I said several times in other sessions, you know, if we come, if we get if 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 we walk out of church having that warm, fuzzy feeling, then I think something something just didn't work out very well. Um, cause, cause our faith is a struggle. Our faith is a war, spiritual war and we struggle to get there. We struggle to climb up that mountain to reach the oasis. It's, it's not an easy trip and it's, there's no path of, we can't, there's no path of least resistance. We just got to get there. We got to do God's will. And in, in the process, probably suffer loneliness, suffer persecution, um, suffer all kinds of, uh, of, uh, difficult, uh, moments and times. Um, and one of them is loneliness when, when people just shun us for doing God's will. Um, so yeah, that's the osis, uh, being, being God like, but not God, because we can't do that. Make sense. Yeah, one second. One second, folks. I need to take a 30 second break. Sorry, folks. So, okay. We answered. That was, I hope that helped for the theosis question is a short, like these are short versions of the question of, of, of um, everything we're talking about. If we want to make it, a, we may, some of these questions, we may make a whole session because they're just so rich. 
And there's so much to talk about, um, but I'm giving you kind of a short answer now so I can do answer everybody's questions. Next question is, when did the church start celebrating the liturgy and what did they do before that? That's a great question. I have some incredible, incredible notes from um, Father, the Reverend Father Pavlos Kumarianos, who was my first year um, liturgy, um, liturgics professor. Okay, I don't have them here. I prom I'll answer that question in, five, in, in about five minutes at our, um, at our next session, and it'll definitely be part of the, the liturgy sessions that we'll have. Because another part of being about, about our faith is on what, we, what do we do on Sunday? Why are we praying this? Why are we praying that? So we're actually going to attack the liturgy at a later date. I'd rather do it when we can all meet versus when we can uh, do the Zoom thing, because there's just so much to see in the church. There's a lot of action that just you can't capture on camera. So we will be meeting soon when we start doing the liturgy thing, because I see how many of us here, three, six, nine, 12, and we can do it up to 25 with vaccinated and unvaccinated. So I think we can do this. We'll be able to pull it off with just enough. Uh, now to answer your question about liturgy, the first initial, the initial, the first liturgy where, where Christ said, take, eat, this is my body, is when they all met for the final supper. So that was technically the first breaking of bread, the first liturgy, so to speak, um, where, the, where the body and blood of Christ was passed around. It did evolve. It did evolve after that um, with petitions and with entrances, and we will get to those details. The, the, the gifts, as you know, as we come out, the gifts used to be in an outdoor section of the church called the Skevophilakion, they, they come in the church. Uh, so there's, um, there has been some organic, and the key word is organic, or, organic uh, um, changes to the liturgy. But I'd like to say, I'd, uh, I'd like to just say somewhere, uh, the, the liturgy we know now, St. John Chrysostom, has about 16, 1,600 years under its belt and hasn't changed very much at all. I, what I would like to do is I will get my notes to do a small breakdown um, for divine liturgy because it's just incredible why they changed some things. They're very important, but they're also very organic. They didn't change out of f fads. They changed because... It was a necessity. And it's, so I, I, I'm not going to fully answer that question today until I get my notes out. I got to go dig it up a couple of boxes, but he has incredible notes. I still remember that class from uh, 20 years ago on how much we learned in so little time. It was beautiful the way he laid it out. So I'll go get my notes and we'll work on it. Sorry about that. Sorry, sorry Natalie. I'm going to give you the short answer on that one. These are fantastic questions, guys. I'm very happy that uh, you did bring up these questions. So I'm kind of getting an idea where everybody is um, is coming from. And uh, does anybody have any more questions? Where well, we got about 15 minutes left. Uh, so theosis. Ah, oh, there we go. We're back on theosis. So theosis being godlike by by participa participation relates to how we treat other people as well as the rest of creation as well as animals, right? Right, absolutely. Um, uh, the key is first 11th commandment to love one another as you love yourself, but that includes all of creation. Absolutely, everything God made was good. And it was for, everything God made is for our benefit. So absolutely. Um, that, that can be a loaded question to people um, who are, who are, um, uh, people like PETA, PETA, People's Ethical Treatment of Animals. Um, we are at the top of the food chain. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's a loaded question. People, when people ask that, we should treat all creation the same, but we are also on the top of the food chain. And God blesses, um, uh, God blesses our, our meals, whether they are, whether you're a vegan or not. So eating certain animals is allowed and, and certain animals are not. And that's, that's, that's also laid out in scripture as well. So I, I don't think that's a loaded question, George, right? Because um, I know you thought that way. <laughs> but yes, there were some saints with special relationships with animals. Saint Seraphim Serov could talk to the animal and especially bears. And that was, it was incredible when bears would sit down beside him. And you always see him an icon with a bear. 
the peaceful bear or something like that, but he could talk to animals as well. Yes, there were several saints that could talk to animals, but Saint Seraphim of Seraph comes up first and foremost. He's got an incredible story. Um, I'm just typing his name in here so you can Google it. Saint Seraphim of Seraph. He's definitely somebody to Google. He's an incredible, incredible saint. Um, and yes, with relationships with animals. There are a few. Uh, we pray to Saint Modestus for our animals to be safe and taken care of by God. He is the patron saint. Um, usually when I'm blessing homes um, all through January and most of the homes have pets like mine, I always pray for the animals with the prayer of St. Modestus because it's in my book and I really, the animals are so important to our, our psychological uh, welfare. They're absolute game changers. And I'm, I'll talk about my two black cats. They're absolute game changers to our family bringing the temperature down and just being there for a hug uh, during the day not that we don't hug each other but you know what i'm talking about sometimes your pets are a little more unconditional than the human what are the t oh next question what are what is some good information on fasting during lent with food since they go hand in hand I will answer that question in one of the next sessions where we do talk about fasting in more detail. Um, absolutely. So hang tight, Kelly. Hang tight on that one. The question before that is a little heavier. What are the church's teachings on the fruits of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit? What a, before I answer that question, I do have to share with you I had a classmate who was in his late 50s. He was a former civil engineer and he um, and, and, and known for the, the known for the um, designing the elevator on the CN Tower. And when his wife passed away, he was my classmate. And he's now Father George Tolias in, uh, in Victoria, BC. But Father George was a big fan, was a big fan of Tony Robbins. Uh, and Brian Tr Tracy, the Phoenix Cinema. And if you guys know who those people are, back in the day, they were like totally maximize your brain power people. Real, uh, and, and the reason, we're, I'll tell you what I'm getting to about this. Um, Father George made a song out of everything when we were in seminary. He made a song. And so I, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the only way I could remember that was in song. And he used to always go love, joy, patience, and peace, goodness, and kindness, and gentleness, self-control, self-control, self-control. <laughs> he had to do that three times for the last one just to get all the syllables in. But um, the fruits of the Holy, those are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And I can only remember them in song because of uh, their nature. Uh, I mean, because, because of how Father George who had who, whose brain power is incredible at 58 uh, taught us the fruits of the holy spirit and um the church's teachings you know what that's a again that's a really heavy subject natalie i'd like to expand on it um and, and the details of it because i'm not a, i don't remember very much up here but i will expand on the fruits of the holy spirit and the gifts of the holy spirit i'm writing these down so that i don't forget to email you back but thank you. I apologize for not answering those, but I'll get back to you. That's awesome, guys. Great questions. I'm sorry I can't answer all of them, but that was my disclaimer at the beginning of the session. Did I miss anybody? So tonight, go to... Tonight, go to Father Andrew Stephen Domic's Lord of Spirits podcast about the Nephilim. So let's take a, that's something to Google and look up and absolutely take a look at. Ah, yes. Greg, um, if asked on the church's position on evolution, what is a good answer to give um, as a lay person? Or whether you're a lay person or a priest, when you're an Orthodox Christian, you do understand that we do have. Um, we don't call it evolution because evolution means it's like a single cell turning into this intelligent design. Okay, we don't believe that. We don't believe a single cell or millions of years can turn into such incredibly intelligent design. That's it. Or a big bang theory of sort of something just blows up and here we have humans. Um, it, it, it's not to any statistician to, that I've spoken to and to any medical doctor who loves statistics that I've spoken to, Christian doctors and non-Christian doctors, 
it's what we have is intelligent design and it's not possible to have it as uh, any Big Bang theory or even evolution. Um, so, but what we do have a, a portion of what we call evolution. One second, one second, please. Um, well, so I'm unmuted now. Okay. So in terms of, uh, we consider it adaptation. So yes, there is a survival of the fittest. And we understand that uh, some animals may have looked very different in the past. So for example, we could say um, there were short giraffes and long giraffes. And the ones that survived were the ones with the longer necks because they could eat the leaves off the tree. So, and, and, and as, um, as they migrated, may, their bodies may have changed. There may have been adaptations to species. And that's okay. Uh, there's lots of room for adaptation, but uh, evolution is a whole different uh, thought process, starting from a single cell to this intelligent design. No, we believe in creation, but over over the centuries, millennia, creation has even changed. We've seen we've seen animals change in the last hundred years, just from our pollution, just from um, foreign things in the air and in the water. We've seen animals change in the process and and die off too. So again, there's adaptation, um, regard, depending on what the, the surroundings with natural or man-made are. So yes, adaptation is the key word versus, uh, versus evolution. Does that make sense, Greg? Awesome question. It's hard for people to understand, to, to, to um, grasp that nowadays, it's it's it's, it's very hard. Uh, um, people don't want to believe in creation anymore. They just don't. It just seems like hocus pocus. And there's a lot of media out there denouncing creation. But like I said, I've talked to every doctor I've talked to. Um, is is um, every doctor I've talked to and, and statistician just can't believe that the statistics allow. The probability doesn't allow for us to just boom show up like this. That's right. They don't want to hear a balanced counterthought. That's the sad part. There's an intolerance now to creation or anything Christian or Bible or faith related, even if it's Islam or they think Islam's crazy. They think we're we're in la la land. So yeah, people are like that. So and even Darwin himself had more of an adaptation. It, it was his his uh, descendants who became a lot more strict with regards to how they felt about um, evolution. Um, Darwin was, was a lot more, had some faith based base in him still. Um, what is the church's teacher on teaching on hesychasm? Hesychasm if the, comes from the Greek word isichia, which means uh, sol quietness or, or silence or solitude. And we do know about, there's a, there's a place for it. There's obviously a place for hesychasm. We hear about monks who are hesychasts who kind of live out in the, in the cave by themselves and pray, in the, pray all day. And there are not fans of visitors, but do get visitors sometimes. Um, but they, they basically keep quiet and keep to themselves for the majority of their week. And they attend liturgy with two or three other monks in a skitti or in a church a walking distance or... It may be a bit of a trek, but they try to keep a life of solitude and spend their whole day in prayer. Again, there is a place for monasticism. Um, and that's very hard to do in the city, uh, almost impossible. So that's why you find monasteries out in the middle of nowhere during a ro in roaming hills and away from society. So they can focus, they can uh, practice. So it just makes it a little bit easier. It, whereas the city, it's virtually impossible. So yeah, there's a place for it, absolutely. But in the right, um, in in the right uh, in the right context. And, and very cool question coming up right now. Why were monasteries established, and what are their purpose? Um, there is a portion of our, our of, of of human beings who, um, as they found over time, were um, just did not could not live in this world 
just uh, and it's not a cop out when I say they can't live in this world. They have special gifts that don't aren't compatible. And, and the world is too tempting for those special gifts to flourish that they have, whether it's prayer, uh, whether it's hesychasm, whether it's regardless of what it is. So monasteries were established in the outskirts of town as far away from civilization as possible in order to, so they can dedicate their lives in prayer without distraction, in silence, as a communal group, which is, uh, as a communal group, which is sacrificing in every way. Um, they, 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 they excel in, in that kind of setting. And not only do they excel, their goal is to pray for the world. So it's a win-win for us too. You know, it's a, they're just, their prayers are so powerful. The sisters at St. Cosmo Monastery's prayers are so powerful because that's the, all they do all day. They have no distractions. They have less distractions out in the wilderness there in the, you know, that, that, that allows them to pray without ceasing, allows them to pray harder, um, more concentrated. And they're praying for us. They're not praying for themselves. They're praying for the world. And I wonder how, how fast this world would have gone out of control if the monasteries weren't praying specifically for the world and its people. So the, it, it's a huge part of our, uh, where we find solitude. I go every year to St. Cosma, the Atolan pre-COVID. We went every year with our family to find our peace, to find peace, to talk to the sisters. Um, to, uh, to witness miracles such as my wife, Presitera, talking to Iron de la Saloxia, and my wife didn't know a lick of Greek, and Yodisa doesn't know a lick of English, and they spoke for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I, I, I remember, I, this was just after liturgy, Iron de la Saloxia, at St. Cosma wanted to talk to my wife, so they wheeled her out into the church. There's no pews in the church, so Yerondisa was sitting uh, on the, um, on, uh, in one of the chairs, and Presidera was in her wheelchair. And I remember we were in a little VIP room after liturgy. I didn't like it, but I guess the sisters really want, were big on hospitality. So I'm sitting here talking to Sister Philothé, a young, a young monastic who's not young anymore, because we're both older now, um, from Chicago. And she's like, Father Nick, Where's Presbytera? And I'm in her Chicago, thick Chicago English. And I, I go, I think she's with Yerondisa. And she looked at me and she said, well, they can't, like, this is the spiritual immaturity of both of us. Well, she can't speak English and, and, and she can't speak Greek. And, and we both kind of rushed out there into the church, down the hallway to the church. And they had been there for 20 minutes and they were talking to each other and they understood each other. And I still remember Yorandisa raises her hand like this in front of Sister Philothea and goes, and doesn't even, doesn't even look up, just raises her hand and says, we have our own language, thank you. She said that in Greek to Sister Philothea and I lost my mind. These are the saints. These are elders who hear confessions on Mount Athos from people from other countries. They're both talking different languages and they're, ta they're talking to each other and understanding each other. And Prasidana understood her, even though Prasidana couldn't speak Greek. And those are the miracles that happen. This is what happens at monasteries when people have so much time to pray. You know, they have, they're so connected with the Lord. They're still human. They're so connected to the Lord that we go to them also for guidance. For you don't this here for guidance. I might have a higher rank as her as a priest, but boy, oh boy, do I go down on my knees when I see her. And which I'm not supposed to, but I'm telling you, she's an incredible, incredible woman, a very spiritual woman. And that experience with Presidera, that a lot of people ex experience with elders, is, is, is things that we find at monasteries because they have so much time to pray and contemplate. And, and they work too, don't get me wrong, they got to feed themselves. So they got to grow their crops and work and do all that kind of stuff. But boy, they got time to pray. And, and, and I can't tell you how incredible that is, the, the experience was. And that's why we go there every year um, to get a blessing from her. And she's like, I want a blessing for you, your priest. I'm like, no, I want a blessing for you. <laughs> You're closer to God. And it's, it's so, we always argue about that tongue in cheek, but they're incredible people. We have such a wonderful treasure into outside of Toronto and St. Cosmos Monastery. So see how, how, what a place monasteries have for us who live in the city. It's a haven to go out there. It's, it's, it's such a haven, a spiritual haven. And it's just beautiful. And again, Peter, as you mentioned before, it embraces creation around us. So like the, that's, a, that's such a perfect setting to connect with the Lord, to be taught 
by people more, in my books, more spiritual than us, to be taught by them there, to pray with them. Uh, if you hear the sisters chant, you will shake and cry. I did that for 25 minutes straight the first time I heard them. So, and that's okay. Um, it's an incredible place. I can't tell you, oops, some people got, it's such an incredible place. And I'd like to apologize for those people who just came in. I dearly apologize because I, I got so excited talking about monasteries and things that uh, I didn't let you guys in, I'm sorry. One more question and then I have a meeting uh, at seven o'clock. So I'm gonna wrap up this question. First of all, thank you everybody. This was, a, what a wonderful day. And the question is, could you go over why we shouldn't read horoscopes or go to mediums and the like? Okay, first of all, horoscopes are fiction. There's a big difference. There's a big difference between, um, there's a big difference between uh, astronomy and astrology. Astronomy is science. Astrology is fiction. All that zodiac stuff. There's nothing religious about it. There's not. It's all suggestive, hocus pocus, and there's nothing. There's nothing holy about lies. Uh, it's just fiction. It's just something somebody makes up that you find entertaining. Um, now, mediums are a whole different issue. Mediums can call upon demons. Um, mediums can call upon demons. And um, you don't want to go there. You don't, you don't want to go there with regards to um, mediums and, because they're calling upon demons and then they'll see your aunt and then they'll see your aunt and, then, and they'll say, your aunt, see, I just talked to your aunt. She says, blah, blah, blah. Or, or they'll see an apparition or you may see an apparition with them around. All of that is demonic activity. You're really getting into hot water and you're not going to like that. You're not going to like that at all. Uh, it's opening portals to into your heart, into your home. And that's when funky things come around. And that's when you're calling the priest for an exorcism. Because it's ugly. Okay. A couple of things. Um, okay. I do, I, do, I do apologize about a couple of things. Yes, the meeting started at 6. I do apologize about if I put down 7 o'clock. It's been helter-skelter. All the meetings from now on, because I, I'm, it looks like I have a lot of seven o'clock meetings and I've been flip-flopping and I apologize. All the meetings from now on will start at six. Regardless of what I write down, all the meetings will start at six o'clock. So I know some of you just came on um, and Ellie just came on too. So let me repeat that. Okay, Ellie, since you're here too, uh, I do apologize. The meeting did start at six o'clock, not seven o'clock, but I have another meeting now, so I can't keep going. Um, again, I apologize to everybody who kind of just came on. All the meetings will start at six from now on. And if I write down seven, I apologize. Um, it will always be six because I have a lot of seven o'clock meetings. So kind of let's, let's do it that way. Now I have recorded this. I have recorded this. As soon as I hang up, it will process. As soon as we hang up in, in the meeting, it will process and I will put it on Facebook. The other two meetings for the other two out of three meetings about the creed are on our YouTube channel. So go look at the YouTube channel and you can access those. And I will have this uploaded tonight sometime after my meeting. I know, I know, Kathleen, you tried to get in at 645, but I was too excited talking about monasteries, and I do apologize. Um, and I didn't see you right away. So, um, this, as soon as this meeting ends, it'll process, I'll upload it. So, if you missed it tonight, I apologize. You will see it on YouTube in the next couple hours. I'll try to process it as soon as I can. Anyways, everybody, thank you for all the thank wonderful you, questions. God bless you. Thank um, you. I'm late for my next meeting, but that's okay. I really enjoyed seeing everybody. And I'll have this uploaded ASAP for those, who, for those of you who just came on. If you have any Thank more, if you, you have, Father. If you have a list of questions and you just came on, email them to me. And uh, yes, I found out how to automatically record this, finally. So um, I'm learning. Okay, God bless all of you. Thank you. Any Thank more questions, you. email me, and I'll email you back. Thanks. Thank Bye. you.